This is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to um, continue on the, the topic of hypothesis testing. And in the previous video, we talked about the general idea behind hypothesis testing and used a justice system analogy to kind of help us understand what was going on. In this one, we're going to actually go ahead and see how we actually make a, a perform a hypothesis test. And for this, we're going to start with looking at what's called a one-sample, um, actually two-tailed z-test. Okay. Now there are actually two basic methods for a hypothesis test. One is the classical test statistic method that's going to be uh, demonstrated in this video, and then the other one is the p-value method that we'll be going over in the next video. So. Um, this will make more sense as we get into this, but the classical test statistic method, we compare X bar values or their, their corresponding Z values, Z scores, and we compute boundary values A and B, which are sample mean values corresponding to probability of alpha and compare it to the measured X bar value or perhaps a Z score. So we're comparing Z scores to Z scores. Okay. In the p-value method that we'll cover in our next video, we compare, compare probabilities, which are areas under the PDF graph. And so we compute the probability corresponding to the measured sample mean and compare it to alpha. So we'll go over the details of these a little bit as we go. So in this video, again, we're going to talk about the classical test statistic method. So let's start with an example here. And again, this is what's called a one-sample, two-tailed z-test. Those words will make sense as we get going here. So let's suppose we're making pistons with the known historical data. We know the population diameter X is normally distributed with mean 4.25 and centimeters and standard deviation 0.12 centimeters. We take a sample of n of size n equals 16 and we find the X bar or mean of the sample is 4.31. Now notice 4.31 is not the same as 4.25. So here's the question. Is that, it's certainly larger than the, than the population mean, or the what we think is the population mean. So the question is, did something change in our process to cause this mean to be larger, or is this just what we normally would get from a, a random situation? Now, if this had turned out to be 4.26, probably you would, everybody would say, okay, well, that's certainly not unusual. If this had been 14, we would say, oh, wow, that's, that's crazy. Something definitely broke on the machine or something. But what about 4.31? Where is that place where we decide that it's, that it's uh, far enough larger that we think that, that, that something has shifted in our process? Okay, Z-tests allow us to answer that question. So here's how it works. Our random variable X is the diameter of an individual piston. And X is distributed normally with standard deviation 0.12. The null hypothesis is that the mean of the population is 4.25. And the alternative hypothesis, H1 or HA, is that mu is not 4.25, not equal to. The not equal to corresponds to two tails, and we'll see that in a minute. The measured sample mean is X bar, which is 4.31, and the sample size is 16. And we need to establish a, le a significance level alpha. In this case, let's use an alpha 0.1. Alpha can be any small value, but it's typically either 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01. In this, type, this case, uh, manufacturing example, let's use kind of a larger alpha of 0.1. Now, according to the null hypothesis, the mean of the individual pist, uh, whatever it is we're measuring, what was it we're measuring here? Um, pistons, and we're measuring diameters. So the mean diameter of the pistons uh, of population is hypothesized to be 4.25 right here and a standard deviation of 0.12 and they're assumed to be distributed normally. So this is the distribution of individuals. But remember, we're not really interested in the distribution of individuals. We're interested in the distribution of sample means. And so the sample means is distributed by this red dotted curve, which is also normal with the same mean, so notice the center up the same place, right, of 4.25, but a smaller standard deviation. Specifically, the standard deviation of the X bars is the standard deviation of the X's 
divided by the square root of n. In other words, the standard deviation of sample means is the standard deviation of the individuals divided by the square root of the sample size. So that's 0.12 divided by square root of 16, and c square root of 16 is 4. 0.12 divided by 4 is 0 0.03. And I contrived this to make a nice number there. Okay, so we've got that. Now it's this red distribution we're interested in, so the next slide I'm going to zoom in on the red curve. And so this blue curve is actually the red curve from the previous one. And here's 4.31 over here. Well, certainly if it was right over right here near the mean, we certainly wouldn't be uh, suspect that as being anything different. If it were way out here to the right or way out here to the left, though we would assume that something has happened. This right here, hmm, hard to tell just by looking. So we need to, to get a number to go with this so we can quantify this. Okay, so again, we have two, two choices at this part. We can compute X bar values or Z scores and compare them to, uh, to each other. Or we can compute probabilities. This one we're going to be using the classical test statistic method. And the alternative hypothesis is that mu is not mu zero. So it's a two-tailed test. So what we do is we take our alpha, we split it into two equal pieces, each of size alpha over two, which is 0.05. So we want to compute critical values A and B so that the alpha over 2, 0.05, is the probability to be below A and also above B. So if we just do inverse norm of 0.05 with that mean and standard deviation, remember this is the standard deviation of the sample means, 0.03, not the 0.12 for the population of individuals, and we get this number here. Likewise, we can do an inverse norm of 0.95, that's 0.05 to the right, 0.95 to the left, and same mean and standard deviation, and we get this, so 4.2 and 4.299. So that's about 4.3 and 4.2, 4.20 4 and 4.30 to two decimal places. And so that identifies these red regions here. Each of these probabilities is illustrated by an area. So the area over here to the left is 0 0.05 or 5%, and that's the probability that, that we would get an X bar value less than 4.20. And the, to the right is 0 0.05 is that area or that probability that we would get an X bar value greater than 4.30, and we got an X bar out here. So since we landed in the red region, the red critical region, we say that it is far enough out there to... Um, to suggest that something has happened to make this a different mean. And notice that the probability that we would land in the red region is only one is only 10%, our alpha level. Okay? If what? If the if the sample actually came from this distribution. It's much more like it's so unlikely for it to land out here, only 10% likely to land in the red region that we assume it's it's more likely that the alternative hypothesis is true and that is that the mean has changed from what it was in the past. Now typically we do this not with the individual values, uh, uh, the actual x values, in this case the piston diameters, but rather their corresponding z-scores. So the classical method, you're, typically we do this, we could have done it just what we just did, but we typically don't do it that way. We do it with z-scores instead. So what we can do is compute the z-score, which remember the z of our is x-bar minus mu over the sigma of the x-bars, or x-bar minus mu over sigma of x divided by square root of n. And this, these distributions of z-scores are distributed by the z-distribution, a normal, standard normal, normal with mean 0, standard deviation 1, standard normal. So in this case, the z is x bar minus 4.25 over 0.03. And if, the, if um, our null hypothesis is true, this, this, this should be uh, the distribution of x bar values, which is standard normal. So now here's the standard normal, and the corresponding critical values right here are the boundary points of this critical region, the red region. And they're just found, since this is a standard normal, they're just inverse norm of 0.05 and inverse norm of 0.95. Or if you want to say inverse norm of 0.05 comma 0 comma 1, or inverse norm of 0.95 comma 0 comma 1, 
The 0, 1 is assumed here if you don't put it in on a TI-84, which is what I used here. And so this produces a Z value of point, negative 1.64485, etc. That's the boundary right here on this critical region to the left. And the critical region to the right has a boundary of 1.64485, etc., which is this boundary right here. And that identifies our critical region. Then we do our test statistic, which is a z-score from our sample. So our sample had a sample mean of 4.31 for our actual sample. We subtract the 4.25, which is our hypothesized population mean mu, and divide by the sigma of the x bars, which was which was the sigma of x is divided by the square root of n. That's our 0.12 divided by the square root of 16, which is 0 0.03. Work that out, and we get a z star of 2. And we see that 2 is in the red region, and so that is enough to reject the null hypothesis. So that's the basic approach for the classic test statistic approach. In the next video, we'll look at how we could do this with the p-value method.